Good evening, lovely listeners, and welcome back to Raven Reads. I'm Raven, and tonight, at long last, we are delving into the world of skinwalkers. Whether deep in the woods or in the middle of the desert, stories can be found of humanoid beings who walk on their hind legs, keep pace with moving vehicles, and perfectly mimic other animals. They can even take on the voices and forms of those with whom you travel, those you trust. Skinwalkers, wendigos, and similar creatures are found mostly on Native American reservations and in communities of indigenous people. Many cultures have their version of the beings that, while perhaps culturally inaccurate, are often collectively referred to as skinwalkers. But lonely highways and campgrounds, funny places here and there, locations where you might not expect them, have also been the subject of these stories. So tonight, we're going to settle in and hear horrifying tales of these creatures, and those who have encountered them. As usual, before we get started on tonight's journey, do be sure to click subscribe and toll the bell if you like this kind of content. That way, you'll be summoned each time we meet to take a journey into the macabre. My data tells me that most of you are frequent listeners, but haven't yet subscribed, and we would love to have you as part of the family and as an official lovely listener. Additionally, you can gear up for our adventures by visiting the Teespring shop where you can find Oh the Horror, Raven Reads, Craft Brew, and, coming soon, hashtag delete that shit merch. You're welcome, Whispered Wednesday crew. The lovely listener and craft brew pin, as well as the inventory I have remaining from the winter collection, are currently in the shop at ravenreadshorror.com. Pins are also available on Etsy for those who prefer to shop there. The links to everything are below. Thank you also to my patrons whose support of this channel allows me to bring you this kind of content and, most recently, add free Fridays, which are Phenomena Fridays. So thank you very much to my patrons for that. Check the link below if you are interested in joining. And now, without further ado, it's time to get comfortable, gather together, and lock the doors. Don't trust the knocks on the walls or the voices beckoning you from outside, because now is the time to take another journey into the night. I'm currently in the hospital with my grandma. She isn't doing well, so I decided that I would stay the night in, just in case things took a turn for the worse. I went outside to smoke a cigarette and get some fresh air. I had to walk the mandatory 300 feet or so from the entrance, so I was decently far from the front door. I was off into a small gravel parking lot that was well lit for once, so no cliché, the area was dimly lit. I could see everything. I smoked my cigarette until I hear a soft, hey come from behind what is one of those dumpsters that are in their own little enclosures with a locking gate, you know? Being used to people saying weird things at this hour, right around three in the morning, I just said, sup, while not looking in the direction of the sound. Then I hear the same, hey, again, but in the exact same tone. I assume it's just some dude having a laugh at my expense, so I just ignore it while I puff away. But again, this thing just said, hey. Again, much to my annoyance, I turned around and said, Listen, buddy. And before I could continue, I saw a scraggly-looking coyote just staring at me. And then it scampered off once I made eye contact. I was taken aback, but since I thought it was just some animal that happened to pass by, I went on to investigate this mystery man who kept saying hey. I felt safe to do so, what with the hospital being within shouting distance. This wouldn't have been completely out of the ordinary, until I thought of something. This is a gravel parking lot. To get anywhere in this lot, you have to cross really loud and crunchy gravel. And all I saw was that dog thing scampering away. No drunk or homeless dude in sight. I didn't hear a single footstep, and there was no one anywhere around. There's no possible way that if an actual person had been there, they could have gotten away without me hearing them. I don't know what I saw, but it reminded me of skinwalker stories. A few years ago, I was taking part in a church camp. We were sleeping in tents on a wide area that was surrounded by a deep forest. The next village was very far away, and it was dark as hell at night without any city lights shining in the distance. 
It always had a kind of eerie feeling, but I didn't think much of it. Well, until this happened. The restrooms of our camp were pretty far away from our tents, on the exact opposite side of the campsite. So if I needed to go to the bathroom at night, I would have to grab a flashlight, get out of my tent, and walk across the whole area of grass and dirt. One night, I needed to pee. So I shook a friend of mine awake and asked if she could go with me to the bathroom. I was hella afraid as we both got out of our tent and started walking. It was deadly silent. The only thing that could be heard was the sound of the river nearby. We got to the bathroom, and as we left a couple of minutes later, I could not get to our tent fast enough. As we were halfway across the land, my heart froze. I could have sworn that it's gotten even more silent outside than it was before, and that's when we heard it. An absolutely horrible scream, inhuman, filled with dread and sorrow. Before anybody says anything, no, it wasn't a mountain lion, and it wasn't a fox. I know what those sound like. It didn't sound like any kind of animal. It was so damn loud that we both jumped a little. It came right out of the dark forest, far away, but so loud that I felt like it was right beside me. It even echoed a couple of times until it vanished and the insects began to make noise again. My friend and I were terrified and ran for our life. I haven't slept right since that night not even a little. I was covering my ears like crazy, too afraid of what I might hear again if I listened closely enough. I don't know if anybody else has experienced something like that. I came across some recordings online that sounded exactly like the scream I heard, and they were labeled as skinwalker screams, or perhaps wendigos. I've had plenty of paranormal experiences before, but since I'm familiar with working with spirits and stuff, I usually know how to handle it. But this scream still sends shivers down my spine, and I have no explanation for it. I know that skinwalker stories are an incredibly old cliché, but I'm only saying that this is a skinwalker experience because I honestly can't think of another creature that fits the description of what happened. So, here goes. A while ago, when I was in early high school, I was left alone at home for some reason or another. I can't remember the reason, but I was left home alone a lot after reaching my teenage years. So a little information on the house is that, although I don't live in a rural area, I certainly wouldn't call the area civilized. There are barns within walking distance of my house. I guess the area is developing, because there are also some subdivisions around. Also, my house has a sliding glass door that leads to a deck in the back. So I was home alone, like I said, when I heard a knock at the door. It's common for my parents to sometimes leave the house without their house keys, so sometimes I have to let them back in whenever they got back. My family has a special knock that we use, so whoever's inside knows that it's one of us. This knock didn't sound like one that my family would use, so I just ignored it because I didn't want to deal with some stranger at the door. Whoever it was knocked again in a more familiar pattern, so I reluctantly went to the door. When I got there, I didn't notice anybody out front. I figured that whoever it was just left because I took my sweet time getting to the door. Then I heard a sound or something coming from the back sliding glass door. Another thing members of my family do is that if nobody answers the door, they'll try to find another way in, such as the back door. So I went to the back door, assuming that part of my family would be there, but I didn't notice anyone outside. I slightly opened the sliding glass door and heard a voice. It sounded exactly like my mother, but it was coming from underneath the deck. I only say this because I definitely heard that voice, but my mother was not in front of me or anywhere that I could see. I can't exactly remember what the voice said, but it was something along the lines of open the door, and it said my name. Now I'm a super paranoid guy, and I know my mom would not be hiding if she wanted to come inside, so I shut the door, pulled the blinds over, and went to my room. Hours later, my mom actually shows up and I tell her what happened. She confirmed that she was nowhere near the house at the time, and that she did not try to get me to open the door back up. So for years, I didn't really know what to make of this experience. In a way, it was a very minor thing, but it still spooked the hell out of me. 
I say this was probably a skinwalker because I don't know any other paranormal entities that would purposefully mimic my mom and try to get me to open the door. Either way, it scared the hell out of me. Growing up, I lived in northeastern Arizona, literally about five miles south of the Navajo Reservation in Winslow. Naturally, being that close to the reservation, or the res as locals tend to call it, skinwalkers were a huge topic of conversation amongst the locals, and we all took it very seriously. Stories of personal experiences abounded. I was no different. Well, to start off my set of stories, I was about nine or so. My family had gone camping in a little spot about 50 miles or so south of town called Hart Canyon, near Wiggins Crossing, if anybody's interested. We had been there all day, and I was extremely familiar with the area, as we had camped there about 20 times or so before, so my parents let me just wander about alone in the woods. This was back in the early 90s. Anyway, I had some G.I. Joes that I had been playing with in the nearby creek. I was about 80 yards from our campsite. There were no other campers there with us. My mom had called me back to camp for dinner, so I left and ate. I played around camp for a while and realized that I'd forgotten my toys back at the creek. So I took a flashlight and headed back that way. I knew right where I had left them, so in no time, I found them and grabbed them up. As I was squatted down to pick them up on the edge of the water, a sudden urgency that I had never felt before ran down my spine. I remember feeling frozen out of fear, like the little boy in E.T. when the alien comes out of the field for the first time and he's trying to scream for his family. I looked up and pointed my flashlight to the other side of the creek, and about ten yards down the way, I saw something. At first, I thought it was a deer, but it was standing up. So I thought maybe it was a bear, but it was too skinny and there wasn't enough hair. It sunk behind a tree and peered out slightly at me. I was seriously scared to move. I had just read a little bit about Bigfoot for the first time since it wasn't really popular in my area, and I thought for a long time that that's what I saw. I finally had seen enough to gather my wits and scram as fast as I could back to camp. I told my parents, and they kind of dismissed it as my imagination, so I just stayed close to them for the rest of the trip. About two years later, I was at my house. I had two dogs. They were outside dogs and lived their whole lives in the backyard. One night, they went absolutely psycho, barking at first at something in the alley behind my house, and then they both started whimpering. I had my window open slightly, and one of the dogs straight up jumped up to the window, frantically chewed through the screen of the window, and forced its way into the house. It wouldn't leave the house for three days. Another time, when I was about 13, we used to play night games in town. Mostly, there being not much else to do, we would walk around our neighborhood and act suspicious so the cops would come chase us around. Silly, I know. We would run down alleyways and hop into random people's backyards and hide. Now, it was extremely common to see an intoxicated Navajo or Hopi in the alley or on the street, so it was no big deal to see one in the alley behind my house that night as we, being two of my friends and myself, ran from a police car hot on our tail. We saw him plain as day standing in our way. We ran around him and jumped into the nearest yard to hide. We waited for the cop to pass us and hop back out. Literally about three minutes went by. We ran back the way we had come, and as we got to the point where the man had been before, he was gone. However, in his place was a coyote, just sitting there and watching us. We ran right past it, feet from it, and anyone who knows coyotes knows that they bail out way before you get that close to them. But this bugger held his ground and calmly sat and watched us run past him. We all freaked out and stayed inside for about a month. My last experience was when I was about 15 or 16. My brother has a girlfriend that lived in a small community south of Winslow called Starlight Pines. It was about 25 miles or so away. Well, we went to go see her one day, and as we drove out about 15 miles out, we saw a Native American guy standing on the side of the road, which was quite odd, because the res was north of town, and it was pretty rare to see anybody on foot south of town, because it's literally just the desert and forest for like 80 miles. Anyway, we see this guy, and he looked normal enough. Flannel shirt. Jeans. We got to our destination and hung out with my brother's girlfriend and her family, 
well into the night, and we finally decided to head back home. We hopped into his truck, a Chevy S10, and drove back the way we'd come. In the same spot, we saw the Native American guy. He was still there. I remember thinking, this dude is crazy standing out here all day and into the night. What the hell is he doing? Right as we passed him, we hear a loud bang on the back of the truck. At first I thought we'd hit an animal, but I hadn't felt anything that we'd run over. I turned around and looked out the back window. My brother started to slow down, thinking there may be something wrong with the truck. In the brake lights, I see this man chasing us. We were easily going 55 to 60 at this point, as we were about to stop. The guy is in the road, feet behind us. I turn around and scream at my brother, Don't stop! Gun it, man! Gun it! He does, and being a Chevy S10, it had a speed governor on it at 80. Two miles. Two miles this guy keeps up with us. We are seriously freaking out. I asked my brother what happens if we don't make it back to town. Or what about when we have to slow down once we get close? After those two miles that seemed to go on forever, I looked back and he was gone. We got home, booked it into the house, and told our parents. Next morning, I get up to head somewhere and look at my brother's truck, thinking about the night before. I wondered what the loud bang was just before we started getting chased. Inspecting the truck, I found a handprint smeared in the dust from about two-thirds over to the right and then smeared to the right taillight. I never went there again. My mom recently shared a strange and creepy experience that she and her siblings and parents witnessed when she was younger, at around the age of six. My mom is a very elegant, classy, prim and proper woman who would not be the type of person to lie about this just to scare someone. Also, my aunts and uncles have verified this story individually. My grandparents, mother, aunts, and uncles temporarily lived in a small village or town in Mexico with a population of about a thousand people scattered throughout the hilly landscape. They lived at the bottom of one of the larger hills, Cerro, that could take a couple of hours to hike to the very top. My grandparents were relatively poor, my grandfather making just enough to provide for their necessities by working at a sugarcane field, but yet they lived in one of the nicer homes because of its proximity to the hill, and an alleged witch's house at the top of that hill. Locals stayed away from the house, and rent was the cheapest out there of all the other much simpler homes available. My grandparents, aunts, uncles, and mom had some paranormal experiences in that home. Most of these were attributed to the witch, in typical Mexican folklore fashion. The skinwalker they witnessed, however, was what made them leave. My mom says that one day she was inside at the entrance of the home with the door wide open, playing with some toys. My aunts and uncles were in the same room behind her, also playing and roughhousing while my grandfather was relaxing on a rocking chair in that room. She happened to look up right as a medium-sized black dog was walking along the road in front of the home. What spooked her was that this dog had two human breasts hanging from its chest that were connected to its skin as though it was part of its body. She said the breasts were hairless, which allowed her to see that they were indeed human and not some sort of tumor or growth on the dog. My mom says that the dog instantly gave her a very bad feeling and she began to cry. This caused the dog to stop in its tracks and look at my mom. My grandfather got up and headed toward the door, as did my aunts and uncles, to see what was happening. He instantly recognized what the creature was and pulled out a small revolver he was always carrying with him due to the long treks he made on foot for his job. He aimed the revolver and tried pulling the trigger, but the gun kept jamming and refused to fire. He tried it multiple times, each time checking and making sure the gun was in proper working order, but it simply would not fire, all while the dog was just standing there watching. The dog eventually turned and started running down the road and into some overgrowth along the side of the road. After it disappeared from view, my grandfather tried shooting his gun and it fired without a hitch. Although they were very limited financially, they moved out within a week after the skinwalker encounter. I know this is long, but I wanted to include every detail that my family members provided me with so I could create the best possible picture of what happened. 
In Mexico, this creature is called a Nahual, but most people refer to them also as a Mexican skinwalker. Unfortunately, both of my grandparents passed away when I was really young, so I can't ask them for more details on the event. I've never heard of skinwalkers partially changing or turning, and I found this quite interesting. Back about 10 years or so ago, my good friend and I would occasionally take trips to her family's property, out in the middle of nowhere. It was fairly remote. You had to drive up a dirt road a few miles and couldn't access it unless you had a key to the chain on the gate. There was nobody around for miles. All that was there was a trailer that they had towed up and left to sleep in. The feeling out there was always a little off. One day, we were wandering around the property, not really thinking much of it, until about 20 minutes later, when we realized we had actually been walking out into the middle of nowhere. We had no water with us, and had no clue where we were. Luckily, we found our way back after a while, but neither of us could explain why we did that. I'd also taken my voice recorder, and we caught quite a few strange things on it. One day, before heading out there, we were talking about Skinwalker Ranch. It was only about a 40-ish minute drive from the property, so we thought, hey, why don't we go and try to find it? We thought it would be cool to say we'd been there. After searching the internet, we found fairly good directions there and headed out for the night. We had a bit of trouble locating it, but after a bit of driving around, we pulled into an area that was spot on from the descriptions we had read. We stepped out of the car, and the first thing we noticed was the massive amounts of bugs swarming around us. Only a few short seconds later, we had huge dogs barking, growling, and running at us. We immediately jumped back in the car and took off. We ended up staying in the area for a little longer, just exploring around. Later that night, back at her property, we were sitting around the fire talking. All of a sudden, we start hearing barking. It was rather startling, and she immediately froze and said that she had never heard barking in that area before. She isn't one to get scared very easily, so her uneasiness put me on edge. Not too long after that, there was more barking. Very slowly, we were being surrounded by what I assumed were coyotes. We both tried yelling, jumping around, and throwing rocks, but that didn't seem to do any good. I've never known coyotes to act this way. We were terrified and had no clue what to do. Not really wanting to stick around and find out if they would get any closer to us, we doused the fire and flipped on our flashlights. She grabbed my hand and we booked it back to the trailer. We were both shaking by the time we made it in, and she locked the door. I don't think either of us slept well that night. I heard a lot of weird sounds and felt a sense of dread the entire night. As soon as the sun started to rise, we decided to pack up and get out of there. We neared the car, and that's when we saw it. On the driver's side of the car window was a huge handprint made with mud. It was easily twice the size of our hands. We looked at each other and silently agreed that we needed to get the hell out of there. That sent shivers down my spine. I'm not saying it was a skinwalker, but neither of us have been able to explain it, and I've never been back. My wife and I were driving up through northern Arizona on Highway 89 between Flagstaff and Page. It was about 1 a.m. as we were on third shift at the time and often drove at night to avoid traffic. I saw a few sets of glowing eyes in my headlights a little ways up, so I let off the gas, slowing down to avoid hitting any animals in the road. When we drove by, we saw several dogs or coyotes on the side of the road, and I hit the gas and drove on by. After we passed, my wife said that one of them was running next to the car, and I looked over and saw it as well, probably about 20 feet off the shoulder of the road. I floored it and looked over, and it stood up on its hind legs. That's the only way I can describe it. It kept pace with us like that for a couple of seconds, before turning away from the road and disappearing. This whole event probably lasted no more than 10 seconds, but it was seriously the most terrifying 10 seconds of my life. This was probably 20 years ago, and we still rarely talk about it. This is a story my family told me when I was growing up. We live in a rural community on the Navajo Reservation. My aunt and her two brothers were home alone while my grandparents had left for the evening to attend a chapter house meeting. They were in the house, and like many people from the reservation, they didn't have electricity. It had been dark outside for about an hour, 
and my aunt and uncles were getting ready for bed. Outside, they heard noises, as if someone was moving things around. My oldest uncle went to look out the front window and saw a figure by the truck. This was immensely out of the ordinary because the closest neighbor was miles away. Whatever it was opened the truck door and began to dig through the personal items that my family had left in the vehicle. My aunt and uncles were frightened by the sight and knew that they should take action. They took out the rifle and they all steadied themselves to hold it up. They flung the door open and aimed the gun at the dark figure. The figure turned and started to walk toward them completely unfazed by the presence of the weapon. My uncle pulled the trigger, but nothing happened. The figure drew closer, and my aunt began to smell something like a rotting corpse. It was so strong that it made her gag. My uncle continued to pull the trigger with no luck, and the figure came closer and closer. Off in the distance, headlights were coming up the road. My grandparents were returning. The figure looked toward the lights and started to move away and tucked itself behind a tree near the house. My oldest uncle ran toward the truck with the gun. My grandfather got out of the car and my uncle pointed to the tree. The thing was poking its head out to observe what we were doing. My grandfather ran into the house and over to the stove and grabbed a handful of ashes, rubbed them all over the gun, and placed an ash-covered bullet in the chamber. He walked out onto the porch and fired toward the tree. Whatever that thing was, was not expecting the gun to go off. The gunshot echoed and the dark figure began running. My grandma chased my aunt inside and my uncles and my grandfather went after it. There weren't many roads or paths, so as my grandfather and uncles chased after the figure, the truck was bouncing and the headlights were not fixed on any one particular spot. My uncle swears that whenever the headlights would hit the figure, he saw a woman. And not only that, Whoever it was, was running on all fours like a bear. My grandfather eventually stopped the truck, and as they neared the ditch that drops about 20 feet, he got out and began to yell in Navajo. My uncle says that he was yelling about a local woman. He yelled that he wasn't scared and that he knew it was her, and to leave his family alone. A few days passed, and there was news that the woman my grandfather was yelling about had passed away. Here's the thing, though. I've always been told that if you know who the skinwalker is, you just have to say their name and it will kill them. My cousin lived in the Eastern Agency of the Navajo Nation in a community known as Crown Point. She was still living with her parents at this time and was a good girl. She had good grades, a nice ride, and was very popular and played on the basketball team. When she told us this story, it was very out of the ordinary and the events that followed would also deepen my beliefs in the traditional Navajo way and of the taboos associated with the Navajo culture. My cousin was coming home from basketball practice, which ran past sunset. It was during the colder months, and so it was dark by the time she pulled into her neighborhood. She pulled into the small housing community that she lived in. It was far from a fenced community, but there were street lights, and the neighbors weren't too far from one another. As she neared her home, she saw a group of dogs, this wasn't unlikely, as there are random packs of stray dogs that roam rural communities. These dogs don't belong to anybody, and they get food where they can. As she got closer, she noticed that something was off about the dogs. There were four dogs, and they were sitting in a circle, all facing each other. This didn't really faze her until she told the story later. Because this was a housing community, my cousin couldn't barrel down the road, so she slowly drove past the group of dogs and kept going on her way. As she continued to drive, she noticed in her peripheral vision that something was running alongside her car. She turned her head to see that a brown dog from the group was trotting alongside the car. She didn't mind much until she hit a strategically placed speed bump. The impact of the bump made her entire car wobble. She looked over at the dog again, still casually keeping pace with the car. She tried to ignore the dog and tried to speed up, keeping in mind where the speed bumps were placed. The dog continued to keep pace. My cousin had to eventually stop at a stop sign. She began to feel immensely uncomfortable and tried to keep her eyes forward. But curiosity got the best of her. She looked over at the dog. It was facing forward. She continued to stare, and that is when the dog turned its head. Instead of the face of a dog, there was the flat face of a man covered in hair and smiling from ear to ear. 
Fear shot through her body, and my cousin pushed the pedal to the floor, not daring to look back in the rearview mirror. She reached her house and barely pulled herself in the door, weak from fear. My aunt came to her, and my cousin began to sob. She told my aunt everything, and they scheduled a meeting with a medicine man the next day. That night, my cousin was trying to get some rest. She was tossing and turning and felt very ill. She could hear people outside laughing and talking in Navajo, but she didn't think too much of it because they lived in a community near plenty of neighbors. At the medicine man, he told my cousin that she was very fortunate. The skinwalker wasn't meant for her. She just happened to spot it while it was out to bring another person misfortune. He also told her that the laughing and talking that she had heard in the night was a skinwalker talking to his friends, letting them know that someone had seen him and that he had scared her. The medicine man told my cousin that if the skinwalker had been for her and she had seen him like that, it could have very well killed her. After the encounter, my cousin suffered from many ailments and had to stop playing basketball for a while. She had many ceremonies and eventually got back on her feet. My mom told us this story on the many nights that our electricity went out. When I asked my cousin about it, she confirms the truth of it, but doesn't like talking about it much, and I don't blame her. Out on the Navajo Reservation, we don't have the city come and collect our trash. So we burn our trash in these huge burning barrels. Not very eco-friendly, I know, but that's what we've got. If you don't light the trash properly, the fire will go out and the trash will just sit in the barrel. This is important because we are told to dispose of personal hygiene items correctly. If you removed all your hair from your brush, make sure the trash burned. If it was that time of month, make sure the trash burned. If you changed your baby's diaper, you got it. Make sure the trash burned. They tell us these things because skinwalkers have been known to dig through the trash in order to find things that they can use against us. They use the things that we were briefly connected to and bring misfortune onto us using them. Some of my family members take part in the sport of rodeo. So, to practice, they have a roping dummy and take turns roping it. My two male cousins were enjoying themselves outside and taking turns swinging the rope at the fake calf. The elders are always adamant that we shouldn't stay out past sundown, especially on the res, where it's pitch black and no one for miles around. But my cousins aren't the superstitious type, and they were under the streetlight, so they thought they were fine. My cousins are joking and laughing and having a great time. That changes when my eldest cousin looks over to the burn barrel. A dark figure is bent over and rummaging through the garbage that failed to burn. My cousins devise a plan that they are going to grab weapons, sticks and rocks, and go chase whatever it is. They move strategically so that they're able to flank the figure. They run full speed at it and begin yelling and swinging their sticks and throwing their rocks. My cousin stated that they kept up with it for the most part, that was, until the figure ran under the streetlight. What my cousins thought was a person was actually a goat. So why would they think it was a person? Well, because the goat was running on its hind legs. They stopped running and fear ran down their backs as the figure ran off into the dark. Feeling nervous and not entirely accepting what they had just seen, they began roping the dummy again. There was an awkward silence among the boys now. They just saw something unnatural, but talking about it now would make it seem real. Were they crazy? Did they really see a skinwalker? The boys roped the dummy in silence until one of them looked over to the tree. There was a head peeking out at them. If they didn't pay attention to it, whatever it was would poke its head out from behind the tree and stare. When they would look in the direction of the tree, it would quickly move back out of sight. This was the final straw, and my cousins ran back to the house. They told their parents, and my uncle came out to look. It was still there, poking its head out and going back behind the tree. My uncle loaded his gun and started walking toward the tree. He aimed and pulled the trigger, but nothing happened. The gun jammed. Whatever it was began to run, but it was so fast. My cousin describes it like a blur. When it left, my uncle came in and gave the boys a thorough lecture about staying out late. The next day, my cousins told my uncle that whatever it was had been digging through the trash barrel. They went to investigate and the creature had pulled a lot of things out of the barrel. What was odd was the tracks. There were goat prints all around the area. They followed a set of tracks and they found a baby diaper several feet away from the barrel. Whatever they had seen that night had very malevolent intentions. My cousins say that although the sight was ungodly, they know what they saw, and they stand by their story.
The Navajo Reservation is the largest reservation in the United States. It goes into New Mexico, Utah, Colorado, and Arizona. This story takes place in the northeast region of Arizona, near Indian Wells. This was told to me by people from around that area. If you're heading west on State Highway 15 out towards Dilkin, you come to a stretch of road that goes into a small valley. I remember going down this road in my youth. If you looked at the horizon, it would seem as if the road kept going. Then suddenly your car would be pulled down by gravity as you followed the road. It would always give me butterflies when we would go down the slope. When I heard the story about this road, it made my stomach feel different. A man was driving home one night, and it was very late. It was a drive that he had done before, so he wasn't too bothered by it. When you're driving on the reservation, sometimes there isn't any way to keep cattle from getting onto the road. No fences means that you need to be extra cautious and aware. I was always told to look for the black horse. If you see a black horse, then you'll be able to see anything else that may wander into the path of your vehicle. So this man is driving home, not paying much attention. He drives down the slope, but when he gets to the bottom of the valley, he sees it but doesn't have enough time to react. Suddenly, a horse comes out of the darkness. He slams on his brakes, but he's unable to stop and hits the horse with his truck. The impact was not enough to deploy the airbags, but the man was tossed around quite a bit by the incident. He turns on his emergency lights and gets out of the car to assess the damage. The front of the car was crumpled and one of the headlights was destroyed. He cursed out loud. This was the worst place to have an accident, and he didn't have a signal to phone for help. He then remembered the horse. The man went into the cab of his truck and got a small keychain flashlight. He started shining around looking for the wounded animal. He heard noises, but they didn't sound like a horse. He was positive that what he had hit was a horse. As he approached the sounds, he could see the animal's fur moving from its ragged breathing. As he got closer, he began to realize what it was. There was a naked elderly woman wrapped in a large pelt. She was moaning from pain. The man stopped dead in his tracks and got weak from fear. He stumbled back to his truck and although it had suffered plenty of damage, was able to get it started and drove off. Once he was able to get signal, he called the authorities. An ambulance drove out there and recovered the woman. She was driven to a local health care facility. Due to the fact that many of the healthcare staff were Navajo, no one wanted to touch the woman. The woman was known in the community, and she was thought to be bedridden. This was shocking, because she was so far from home, and the state she was in was immensely off-putting. She still had on her attire when she arrived at the hospital. The nurses called her family to come in. When her family got there, they removed her pelt and her jewelry. The staff were very frightened but there were some non-Navajo staff that still provided her with care. The elderly woman had only bumps and scrapes. Other than that, she seemed completely fine. She was even able to get up and walk around that same evening. She went home with her family that night, but after a couple of days, she had passed. In the Navajo culture, if you find out who a skinwalker is, you have the power to destroy them. After the community around Indian Wells found out who, or more fittingly, what this woman was, it was for certain that her time was at an end. So for context, I live in Southern Maryland on a large plot of land. We have three large farm dogs, two of whom are German Shepherds. They're very used to all the animals that peruse our property and rarely get spooked or upset. We also have lots of livestock, and it's not uncommon for us to lose a random animal or find a pile of chicken feathers in the corner of the property. However, we've always been able to explain it or add extra protection for our flocks. Around eight months ago, we started losing chickens at an alarming rate. They would just disappear, and even our shepherds couldn't scent them anywhere on the property. For a while, we figured it was just a barred owl or some other bird of prey. The main problem with that theory was that 10 would disappear at a time, rather than a normal 1, max 2. We decided to put up a trail cam to watch our most eastern flock. Almost immediately, the problem stopped, so we took them down. But then it got stranger. I've always gotten sleep paralysis, and I like to believe that I'm pretty comfortable with my sleep paralysis demon by now. It's never really been something that concerned me. 
However, around the same time as we started losing mass amounts of chickens, I would see something different in my sleep paralysis. Where my demon was always chilling out in the same corner and never moved, this thing would hang from my rafters and move back and forth across them, almost like a really fast sloth. It had long ass fingers and looked really skinny, like a super emaciated human with a weirdly long head. I've noticed that it literally always stared at me from any part of the room it was in. At the time, I decided not to worry about it and figured it was just a bad bout of anxiety. That brings us to September of 2018. One night, I woke up at around 2, completely able to move my body. Everything seemed normal. No one else was sleeping in the house that night, but that's pretty standard around that time of year. I glanced up at my rafters and saw the long-fingered thing moving and looking at me. I immediately turned on my bedside lamp, and it was gone. Yet again, I chalked it up to stress and decided to go downstairs to grab a cup of water. All of our dogs were happily asleep, so I went back to bed and turned off the lights. The second that it was dark, I could see it again, without my eyes having to adjust. This freaked me out enough, but all of a sudden, I heard our Rottweiler get up and start growling at the door. He rarely barks, let alone growls. I called out his name, but he kept going. He got louder and louder until the other dogs woke up and joined in. At this point, I was flipping shit, so I turned my light back on and grabbed my hunting rifle and flashlight. I went downstairs and took two of the dogs outside. I swear to God, I have never heard a night so silent. I moved my flashlight slowly around the perimeter, looking for the shine of eyes or really anything. All of a sudden, our chickens started going crazy, like so loud that they distracted the dogs who sprinted out toward them. I followed them, only to find zero chickens outside and our fence completely torn down. There's no animal in our area that could even attempt to do that. So we hauled ass back inside and camped out for the evening. It was quiet after that. And when morning came, all of our chickens were safely inside their coop. I stupidly figured the problem was solved and decided not to worry about it. The only thing was, I started seeing this long-fingered rafter thing every single time I turned my light out. Eventually, I got so freaked out that we decided to call a shaman. She told us that we had a wendigo problem and that she would come and sage the house. We opened every single window and door and let her do her thing. And since then, we haven't had any problems indoors. The issue now is that when we walk our dogs at night or go put the chickens inside, I swear I feel someone watching me. I've had a couple other people bring up that they feel strange outside at night and nobody goes out alone anymore. Whenever we walk our dogs near the woods, even in broad daylight, they'll get so anxious that we've taken to walking them on leash in general, we just avoid the roads near the forest entirely. The creepiest part is sometimes at night we hear lots of screaming. We often assume, of course, that it's the coyotes, but every once in a while, it's just off enough that we get scared. A couple of times, it's been a lone shriek, which is very uncommon for coyotes or even foxes. A few nights ago, we were asleep in bed when we heard a scream from directly outside our window. My partner was worried that someone was hurt, so he opened our window and yelled, Is everyone okay? We heard a loud shuffling sound, almost like someone scrambling off of our roof. It sounded much heavier than a bird of prey, but way lighter than a person. Our dog started barking, and within a minute, we heard another scream a good half mile away. Welcome back. I do hope you all enjoyed the selection of stories. I very much enjoyed getting back to recording. I know it's been a long time. Um, many of the stories that I read tonight, the Navajo ones in particular, are from the same person. Um, this person will show up in the other parts of this uh, series as well. And I will link all the stories down below and you should definitely check out their Reddit page because they have a lot of really interesting stories. I have a March update video coming up for you guys soon. I was going to post it first, but I really wanted to get like a real video out before I posted an update video. So uh, the collaboration with Anina Nightmare is really late on my part and I feel really bad about it. For some reason, the files kept either 
jumbling about when I would export them, like they would be in the wrong order, or they would corrupt. And I think the issue is that part of the files were mp3s and part were wave files, so I think that I know that for some reason the program that I use sometimes doesn't like mp3 files, so I'm gonna try converting them into WAV files and see if that works. Hopefully like I put on the community tab day after tomorrow, I should have that finally up. I feel so bad, but yeah, uh, it was originally gonna be like a week late and then I listened to it back and it was all out of order and I've been trying to fix that issue ever since. Um, also, for those who don't listen to the Whispered Wednesday things, I did a sort of update as a Whispered Wednesday, and uh, to summarize for those who did not listen to that one, basically I was supposed to start that other full-time job, so I would have had a part-time remote job from home, and then a full-time job. Um, I worked that full-time job for two days and quit because of ethics. Uh, I could not ethically stay there. It was a long story. Um, if you want to know and you can tolerate whispered content, um, then listen to that one. Otherwise, if you want me to tell the story again, I will um, briefly, but like in another place, uh, maybe during a live stream or something. Let's see. I think that's the only update I have. Oh, but anyway, after I quit that job, literally the next day I was hired on full time at my remote job. So it's a very scientific and technical job and it's a very steep learning curve. Um, I'm doing a lot of scientific writing and it has just taken a couple weeks to kind of ramp up for that. So that's why I was gone again. So I think anybody with a job and Bills understands that you have to put your job first. And um, so yeah, I just had to prioritize some life stuff, but I should be back more frequently coming up here, but yeah. And then the other update that I had in the Whispered Wednesday video, again, I will put this in the March updates, but is basically just that there's um, new series that I'm gonna keep up with, like Phenomena Fridays, which are ad-free now thanks to patrons. And the black and gold pins, I uh, finally figured out what happened there. I was communicating with two people from the company, and the one that I mainly communicate with, um, I hadn't heard from, and I was trying to figure out what was going on. One of them emailed me, the other one emailed me, and said, hey, do you have an update on finalizing this design? And I was like, are you kidding me? Like, the one that I submitted in November, that one? <laughs> So basically what happened is that the per one of the people that I was talking to thought they were waiting on me and the other person thought that the first person had already submitted the order. So yeah, essentially the, the order never even got put into manufacturing because of communication breakdown. So <laughs> yeah, I'm not excited, but shit happens. It's a mistake. It's okay. So I was going to put two pin orders in at once for this next round, but honestly, I just want to get this black and gold pin fucking made and here so that I can ship it to the people who have already pre-ordered it. If you already pre-ordered that pin, you will be getting the next pin in the series for free because I feel like that's the least I can do <laughs> to make up for the fact that it has been so long and not one of you has complained and I can't thank you enough. Like, I know most of you realize it wasn't my error, but... I still feel really bad because that's been a long wait. So anyway, that's why we do shop differently now. The ravenreadshorror.com shop thing is back up. I decided to go ahead and stay with Shopify. I had checked out a bunch of other options and I just, I like Shopify the best. So um, it's very easy to use. I like their reporting. So uh, we're just going to stick with that. So that is back up and running and the pins are available. The ones that I already have on hand are available. And I'm slowly putting up inventory that I have from the winter collection that was supposed to be show inventory, convention inventory. But as most of you know, I wasn't able to go to the convention. So I do have that inventory that I need to put up because I can ship that immediately. Spring shop will be opening in April, but I will have all of the stuff that I have on hand up in the next week or so and with accurate inventory and all of that on the site so that if you want any of that stuff, I don't see the point in waiting for shop opening to put listings that I have on hand. It just doesn't make sense. They're here. I can ship them. So um, the only reason that I'm doing shop the way I'm doing it now where I'm opening it up like once a month 
or once every couple months, depending on how it goes, um, is just so that I don't have to have like the pin issue again, where, you know, if something gets held up in manufacturing, then you're not waiting for your items forever. But for items I already have on hand, I don't think I need to really wait for that, <laughs> you know, because I have them. <laughs> so uh, any inventory that I have on hand will always be available. And then um, seasonal, like project based stuff that I'm ordering just for the shop. Shop will open uh, probably April 2nd. And um, yeah, that'll be exciting. I have a whole spring launch planned. But of course, I want to wrap up all the stuff from winter before I work on that. So those are the only real updates I have for you guys, I think. A lot of you have been asking about Whispered Wednesday. If the last thing that I posted was a Whispered sorry for the bell. Um, if the last thing that I posted was the Whispered Wednesday video, then I'm not going to post another one. So like if I don't get to post a video between Wednesdays, I'm not posting two in a row. Um, those are really kind of just for fun for the people that like them, but I don't want there to be two stacked next to each other because yeah, it's not an ASMR channel, so I would like to have some regular content in between. Not opposed to making a channel of the whispered content with some ASMR-ish stuff for those who like it, so yeah, I guess let me know in the comments if that's something you would like in the future, but that would probably be um, summer, so yeah, probably summer because <laughs> I have some other things to catch up on first, but um, yeah, that might be interesting. But anyway, there will be more content coming soon. And that is all the updates that I have for this. I do have the March update video coming, but that's more detailed. But that's all you really need to know for now. And yeah, thank you guys so much for your patience. And thanks for being here. And I do hope you enjoyed tonight's stories. I will see you guys in the next one. Bye for now.